The content of this video is for educational purposes. Any decision to revise one's clinical practice is the sole responsibility of the individual clinician. All right, so a couple of disclosures. I am a reader from the mind to mind section of anesthesiology. That's our journal, if you don't know. And there is a small section in the back in between the desperate ads for new chairman um, and other drug studies that uh, creative writing is placed. So I read for that and uh, I'm about five or six away, I think from 400, Stephen. Um, Stephen is the current editor back there joining us, uh, I guess we're representing the journal today. And uh, so I do that. Um, and then in terms of poetry, there's no money in poetry. So I don't have any conflicts of interest in that way. There is suspicion and derision, but no compensation. So I've got that. All right. Uh, when I talk, talk about art today, a lot of times I'm going to talk about writing in general, poetry in specifics. But I want you to keep, uh, when I say that, hear art, hear it broadly. I don't know anything about music. Um, there are musicians in the department, Joe, Michael Pilla. I don't know anything about painting. I don't know anything about dance. Brittany Raymond might remember something from her college days uh, or Warren Sandberg. I don't know anything about theater or movies or sculpture or photography. Raj, Michael Pilla would be your people to talk to about that. But I want this to stay broad. It's not going to make you uncomfortable. This will be for a few reasons. I want to... Um, uh, as adult learners, we often get frozen in terms of where we are, and it takes something a little bit shocking for us to see our biases, um, see uh, how we're processing things. So I'm going to try to do the work of art that sometimes is a little shocking, and I'll try to replicate that as best I can in the 6 a.m. lecture format. Um, also, we're going to talk about social science and uh, medical humanities research, and it's pretty insipid stuff compared to what our left brains want to see. Um, it's, it's kind of bad. So we'll go over some of that research, the, the best of it, it's not so great. And that's going to be a little uncomfortable. And if you have read enough on the slide, um, I'll make this a little bit of nudity that uh, is going to be in the presentation shortly. And then I'm going to use a word that starts with S that uh, is not surgeon. And it's not something you typically hear in Grand Rounds. And I just don't think it can, it's introducing an idea that a writer offers us as a tool for writing. It's very hard to divorce that word from the way she uses it. And so my apologies, and I'll have a little bit of disclaimer if you're Zooming at home with your children, um, like I have done from time to time. And I think that's it. Oh, and, and the other real reason is that the red cap surveys we fill out about the big demand for more nudity and profanity and grand rounds. So we're gonna deliver. All right, objectives today. I'm gonna talk broadly about the academic discipline that'll be more theoretical. Then I'll move into more practical applications of how the medical humanities works on a medical campus. I'm actually not going to write about the sonnet. I've learned one thing well, that uh, in general, the anesthesia community does not like sonnets. Um, so we'll stay away from that. Actually, actually, I put that in there because I was going to do a little bit of a workshop, but I don't think we're going to have time. So we're going to cut that today. And then again, I'm going to, that's okay. I'm going to uh, talk about some tools that I think you could use in your academic and uh, writing life. All right, this is a story that's gonna to be told in five chapters. Chapter one is about me. Why me would it be how I would ask this? And like any good story, it starts once upon a time, there was a Bosch freezer fridge combo that decided to stop working. This was in the winter, January of 2011. And uh, the saddest part uh, really was that the ice cream went bad. So I ate as much as I could and then I called a repairman. And he could only come on a Monday night, I believe it was. He said, well, my first appointment, 6.30, 7 o'clock, Monday night. So the repairman shows up and begins talking, um, trying to figure out why the freezer is not working, but the refrigerator is. And as he's doing this, you know, kind of exploratory laparotomy on the back of the freezer, uh, my wife hands me our eight-month-old Adele and says, here, take this. I've got to go to work. She was working at the Sloan um, family clinic, uh, uh, which is a wonderful charity group if you don't know it, but she was working there after she'd finished her infectious diseases fellowship. And she grabs her white coat, stethoscope, goes out the door. The repairman, originally from California, looked at me and had been very nice, uh, a little strange, but very nice up until this point says, well, what's up with that? Is your wife a doctor, man? And every fifth or sixth word was man. And I said, yeah, she was a doctor. And he's like, doctors almost killed me. I was diagnosed with some sort of cancer 
and I had six months to live. And what was killing me was the medicines and their treatments and the tests. And I did not get better until I started ignoring the doctors, stopped taking any of their medicines and just remembered that there was a power within me that could heal. And once I remembered that power and started smoking lots of marijuana, I got better. And really we don't need doctors. We don't need the kind of care that doctors offer. We need to remember the power within, we need marijuana and heroin and that these were what got me through. And he continued on with a couple other things and mentioned that compulsory education probably should stop at fourth grade because we have everything we need to know at that point. And that if he had all of that, the marijuana, the heroin and a fourth grade education, he could be out repairing freezers, fridges, other appliances, and he could be playing his music because that's really what he wanted to do. And then he made the comment that he was in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And I, there was a little disbelief on my part. And I ended up Googling his name and he actually is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And I sat there for a second and I, I could not ask the question of, if you're in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, why are you on the floor in my kitchen on a Monday night repairing this refrigerator, freezer? And he said, well, it's, it's my life. I wake up at two or three in the afternoon. I play my guitar some, I, I go to work. I put on this little monkey suit, come out, fix people's appliances. And when I finish with you out in my van is my guitar and I'm going to drive to a bar, meet up with my buddies and I'm going to play music till two or three in the morning, then go home, go to sleep, wake up the next afternoon and do it again. And I thought that was amazing. And then he looked at me and says, what do you do, man? <laughs> and, and I thought, you know, based on his drug experiences and whatnot, the last thing I want to say is anesthesia. So I said, I'm a writer. And, you know, I, I, uh, I haven't made it big yet. Uh, my wife, you know, she pays a lot of the bills. I, I cook, I clean, I take care of the baby. But, but uh, one day I'll be a writer. And I ended up texting my wife some of these wonderful things this guy was saying. They were so unique. So idiosyncratic. And as I looked at it on the screen, this was a Blackberry at the time, I thought, you know, a couple rearrangements and a couple line breaks. And uh, this guy is, I mean, this, this guy gave me a poem, like he is a poem. And at the time, our journal, Anesthesiology, had started putting out ads for this new section called Mind to Mind, uh, where they wanted creative work from the perioperative area, whether you work in it or whether you're a patient. And they had just started, I think January 2011 was also the first time there was a, a piece in print in that section. It wasn't actually a new section. The journal had had it in the past, in the 60s and 70s. And uh, I'm drawing a blank on the editors. Mike uh, Eisenach? Okay, Mike. Jim, Jim was the editor. And so he had wanted this to come back. He is a scientist. He is still had a fair, right? He went from the journal to fair. He actually he runs fair. Yeah. Yes. So, yes. Yes. Yeah. Amazing scientist, you know, at top of his field and yet has an appreciation for the arts, wanted to bring this back. So I submitted, uh, kind of fired off the poem and then didn't think anything about it. And uh, a few weeks later, I get an email from the editor saying, really appreciated your submission, really connects with humanity. We want to publish it, you know, fill out the little disclaimer, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, oh, that's cute. I'll send it to my grandmother when it comes. And then it, it came. So I cut it out, sent it to my grandmother. And on a Wednesday morning over in the children's hospital, this guy walks by and says, hey, saw your poem. Good job. That's a peer reviewed publication. That counts towards your academic career. And I thought, what? You know, for, for probably two or three years, I had been working with airway equipment and difficult airway studies and stupid, stupid IRB. And, and I just thought, what? Because really from conception to submission, maybe 15 minutes. And, and I just thought, I was like, there's something here. I, I know, I know there's that, we'll get there, we'll get there. And so I wanna tell you that your career can take very weird turns in a sudden moment. You never know who you're going to meet or what they're going to say, um, but don't, don't think you know where you're headed. You know, the future is very dynamic and you never know what's going to happen. Another weird moment, part of the years of preparation was finding this the summer before first grade. Uh, this is a novel and this is the picture I was talking about. So you've seen this before, but we, my family, my uh, parents and my brother and I were at my grandparents in Mississippi Delta, we're packing up the car to drive back to suburban Atlanta, past the pool table, past the farm desk office where you weren't allowed to play. It was a little bookshelf where they kept books 
that did not have doctors who sort them up. It's, and there was this, and I was like, wow, look at that. So I picked it up and my grandmother probably said, you can take that filth, it's your aunt's, I don't want it. And so I start reading this um, as we're driving back from the Delta to Atlanta. And I remember getting to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Highway 82 on the west side where it intersects with Interstate 20, there's an Arby's. And as we get to Arby's, um, in between, well, back up, in between the farm and Arby's, the shark has been eating people, right? That's the story. You go into the water, you get eaten. So sorry if you don't know the story and I ruined it for you. <laughs> this woman does not survive in, intact. So by the time I get to Arby's, they had realized this woman who starts out the movie swimming is missing. They think she had drowned. So they send out police and they don't have iPhones. They don't even have radios. They have whistles for some reason. I guess this is the seventies. And by the time I get my sandwich, one of the police officers had found what's left of her. It was her torso, part of an arm, her head. Um, she was, you know, uh, non-resuscitatable and uh, eventually describes the blue gray flesh covered in green seaweed, little crabs coming in and out of her rib cage, clacking away. And I'm looking at that and I'm looking at my Arby sandwich and I look at the torso and I look at the sandwich. And I'm like, I, I am not hungry for this anymore. And it really was years before I ate an Arby sandwich again. And I learned two things. I learned some vocab words that got me in trouble. And this is Doyle's first grade class. And I also learned I wanted to be a writer, that I was blown away with the power of what this one paragraph, uh, just a few sentences, the effect it could have on me, totally blown away. And I knew I would write in some form or fashion. So I wandered into journalism, always thinking I would go to medical school, um, ended up in medical school, ended up in anesthesiology, despite the fact I ranked a bunch of surgery programs. And, uh, but I always knew I would be writing in some form or fashion. So uh, with Stephen, I ended up in a master's of fine arts program at Murray State University, uh, Kelly Mishra's alma mater and have this MFA and continuing to find a way to write. So I would remind all of you to, you know, if you're not doing something you love, if it's not part of your job, then something's probably wrong. So uh, don't quit, you know, we're trying to hire people and that's not what I'm saying, but, but you know, find a way to do what you love. All right, finally, we'll move to the medical communities. It is kind of in two camps. There's the academic camp where people write about what it is. We're gonna talk a little bit about that in the, uh, the next couple slides, but there's also the practical part where people are actually doing arts. And I think the people on the art side look at the people on the academic side and say, those are the wannabes. They couldn't be artists. And so they ended up in academics. And conversely, the academics are looking across saying, those are the posers, those are the hobbyists. They don't really do the, the academic work. So I'll try to go back and forth between the two camps. I probably live more in the artist camp. And I'm going to use a little bit today, a case study from this book uh, by Leila Shati, a young woman who has written a fascinating, if not strange book about menstruation. This is a book of poems. And she was diagnosed in her mid-20s with a uterine tumor. And she talks about the process in poems that are all individual poems, they stand alone. And yet she tells this arc of how she uh, was diagnosed, what she went through, how miserable it was in the ER sometimes trying to convince people she needed help, how she got into gynoc, how she had surgery and what the healing process was like and how it affected the relationships in her life. It's a phenomenal book. You can pick it up and understand it easy. She's not, uh, she's not very formal in terms of what she's doing poetically. So I'm going to do something I hate doing when people read slides, but poetry is meant to be read. There are sounds and rhythms. So I'm going to read one short poem that's not about me. Once you see the ending of it, you realize, no, not him. But um, this is her poem, and I'm just going to read it. And hopefully this will be the only time I read you a slide. But just listen to some of these sounds. The handsome young doctor who is very concerned, Layla Shati. The handsome young doctor who is very concerned with the future possibility of my body in a bikini insists more salation, a tiny bicorn prong inserted through a minuscule slit in my belly. You'll barely see it, he says, grinning, as though I'm already convinced. I imagine the tumor minced, the blade a dervish spinning. I say, I've read this is dangerous. He says impassive, of course, everything has risks, already checking the time on his wrist. Some of the things going on in here that affected you, but you might not be conscious they affected you are, uh, I'll talk about three brief things. The line breaks. We don't have this in prose, but in poetry where the writer hits return matters, your brain 
heels along with your eyes as you move along the line. But as your eye moves from one line to the beginning of the next, your brain is going to tug on the leash a little bit and go somewhere. And she plays with that where she places these line breaks. There's also the rhymes, uh, grinning, uh, uh, now I'm losing, I'm sorry. It was minced, convinced, dervish, spinning, go grinning and spinning. So these rhymes that, that don't show up at the end of the line, like we're used to in the poetry reading school, she is, she's densely packing this with those rhymes so that you hear them, but you don't really see them. And yet it still affects you. And then this S sound shows up all over the place, right? Handsome, concern, possibility, insists, morselation, minuscule, spinning, minced, dervish, dangerous, wrist. This S sound in the English language, I assume in other languages, we associate with danger, possibly because of the snake as a hearkening back to Eden. But she is telling us danger, danger, danger in this piece. So then you add the content of a woman kind of being victimized by the medical system, by a complete jerk of a surgeon. And those are just some of the background things. So we'll come back a little bit to this poem as a case study. But now we can finally go on to chapter two, the medical communities. What is it as an academic discipline? What do academic, what, what does a discipline need to be academic, right? Well, you've got to have journals and medical communities has journals. These impact factors are not the most wowing. It probably could be worse, but they have their journals. We'll give them that. They have associations. I just grabbed two. The associations have meetings. The meetings are manifold and all over the place. Some are better than others. Some are more academic. Some are more focused on producing the arts. We had canceled last year. It was going to be hosted by the Vanderbilt on the undergrad campus, a very large medical humanities international conference that basically, if you can figure out a specialty on the undergrad campus, it could have fit under their umbrella. It was how broad they were in this meeting that was modified to be an online meeting. There's, to me, kind of a strange disconnect between what goes on on the undergrad campus in the medical communities and a complete lack of relationship with our medical campus, but it is what it is, part of that divide of the posers and the wannabes. What else do you need to be a good academic discipline? You need famous people. So this is Rita Sharon. She is an internist, graduated from Harvard in the late 70s, then went to Columbia, got a PhD in literature. And she basically birthed the field of narrative medicine, which is a subset of the medical humanities. The idea being that our stories, our narratives are part of the healing process. We are more than physical objects and our emotions, our family relationships, all that matters. And people could probably give a talk just on her. She gave a Jefferson lecture a couple of years ago, which is the highest uh, humanities lecture you can give in the country. Uh, and she's a phenomenal thinker. This is Carol Casella. She was the editor of Mind to Mind who accepted that poem I submitted. Uh, she's an anesthesiologist, so that's good. Um, and a novelist, which is good. And she lives out in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, when people ask me, what can I read to understand? I refer them to her novel, Oxygen, which does the best depiction of some of the intra-op scary things we face that I've so far read. I'm open to suggestions, but I haven't found anything finer than hers. Um, she's no longer the editor of that section. It's gone a little downhill in the last few years, but, uh, but things happen. This is Joanna Shapiro. She is a poet and an anesthesiologist. She is out at the Palo Alto. It's interesting because she has lived in both camps. She's written about the medical communities in terms of being a discipline, and she also produces poetry. This is William Carlos Williams. I put him here just because he won the Pulitzer and not many physicians have done that. He was a poet in the 20s, 30s, 40s, um, and a little bit later, but I think that was his prime. And his career probably was most stymied by the fact that a guy named T.S. Eliot published The Wasteland right as Williams was hitting his stride. And Eliot kind of turned American or English letters, British and American, on its head. And he lost out. I put these famous people up here to say, your night job does not have to be your day job unless you're on periop. And then it is. <laughs> but don't, you know, as, a, as an SRNA, as a resident, probably your education is the most important thing. But there will be time for other stuff later. So don't think you just have to do your clinical work. What else do you need to be an academic discipline? You need controversies. And this helps people have jobs because they can write papers. This helps uh, publishers and editors have jobs because they can read those papers. But some of the controversies in the medical humanities are who owns the material. When I write about a patient, am I stealing that patient's story? Rita Sharon would say yes. I would say, well, what if I change the details? 
and make it a different sex, a different pathology, a different age, a different race. And she would say, not only are you stealing that person's story, you're defacing it, um, kind of a downer. Uh, one, one contention between the two camps is who's more important, which way does power flow? Um, I'm gonna start to cut a little of these to get to the end here. Uh, can the medical humanities be productive in and of itself or is it a parasite? Some, some critique the way that the humanity shows up to medicine saying we're here to fix your sins and we'll be your savior. That frustrates a lot of the medical side of the medical humanities people. And there's discussion that can it really teach professionalism? It's used all over to do it. Can it? Maybe we'll, we'll look at that, about that in a minute. And what exactly is it? That's been one issue. And I'll add this. When you get frustrated about something, you can write a letter or an editorial. And so these, these um, controversies have led to lots of stuff in print, and it can do that to you. Maybe not about the medical humanities, but as you read things, encounter things clinically, do something about it. Write somebody. A pro tip would be also, when you do that, to look to see if, when you fire off that letter about an article, if there's an editorial accompanying it. Stephen and I had the experience of writing a letter to an editor about an article and seeing it go to print, which was very exciting, but unaware because it's just the way we work, I guess, unaware that there was an editorial with that particular article. And so the reply was not written by the article writers as it usually is. It was written by the editorial writers, which was the Sandberg et al. group in Nashville. <laughs> that was a little awkward. So do your homework, do your homework better than we did. Uh, in terms of definitions, thinking back to that last controversy, many definitions of medical humanities, these are all actual quotes. So something real vague, it's the intersection, right? Here's someone who talks a lot more specifics about these different fields and how they interact. This final quote is from one of those famous people, a dilute non-critical mishmash of applied theory without academic depth, rigor, or demarcation. So, uh, and this is from someone who works on both sides. I think perhaps it's akin to the story of the blind people looking at the elephant, feeling it out, and they, they feel it differently, describe it differently, They're describing the same entity, but totally different. One way to see it maybe, perhaps another, is that the definer is trying to sell you something. Oftentimes that person has a reason they need to define the medical communities that way because of their career. So I'd be a little bit uh, skeptical. Um, speaking of selling things, 40114, if you're Zooming at home, give that a second. Uh, this quote, I think sums it up. No definitions is proof that the discipline is an ongoing debate with itself. Medical humanities should most of all stay messy. If that's not the glass is half full, I don't know what is. And what's interesting is this woman is just a PhD candidate. She is a philosopher, a philosophy student in Copenhagen. And I find it fascinating that she can have a, a major journal publication inside their field. And she's just a PhD student. So I think that's pretty cool. Chapter three, we're making progress, the field at work. So we're gonna talk about some of the areas uh, that she described, um, and I'm going to cut a few corners to get to the take-home parts, but one area she says is that there's an inquiry into medicine from art as an interdisciplinary research. I had no idea what this meant until I found this supplement to the Clinical Infectious Diseases Journal that talked about typhoid, and they used historians, they used uh, biologists, they used uh, financial people like business professors, and they would write these fascinating articles where they just talked about the history of typhoid over the last century, how a treatment came out, a vaccine was rolled out, there was some uh, difficulty getting people to accept the vaccine. Uh, they talk in another, another article about how the money uh, and donors influenced how the vaccine was rolled out, how uh, the public accepted it. They talked about how poverty was an issue. And they talked about how kind of uh, random antibiotic use has led to a resurgence of typhoid in low and uh, middle income countries. And, you know, two years ago, I would have laughed at this and been like, how could people not accept the vaccine, right? I mean, like, what's up with that? But uh, history repeats itself, I guess. So um, that's the inter interdisciplinary side. Art is therapy. Um, there are, there are enough studies on music therapy to do review articles on randomized control trials <laughs> on orthopedic pain. So that's, there, there are lots of studies out there. Now they're not, they're not that great. This looked at, this is better than some of the others though. This looked at music therapy in PACU, in US, UK, 
Taiwan and Japan, I think were some of the articles they had pulled. And they basically blasted patients with music and they found that subjectively things got better, physiologically not better. It sounds kind of like placebo effect, but at the same time, if the patient's walking out of PACU and they had a better experience, maybe that worked. I've actually seen this where I did my surgical internship. One day there was a harpist in PACU, a giant full on, you know, wedding recital harpist and patients are rolling by and no one was crying in PACU that day. It was very quiet. All the patients were totally bug eyed, staring at their PACU nurse saying, my surgery, did something go wrong? <laughs> so awkward but 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 uh but i have a special place for music therapy because of that um music therapy has also been used with geriatric patients looking at alzheimer's and uh in brief they did um sessions uh twice a week for six weeks with uh nursing home patients and they would do like a welcome song little games name that tune some dance moves and then a closing goodbye song it sounds like kindergarten and they found some improvement in uh, mental mini status and anxiety scores. So, you know, those, those patients seem to do better. There is a ton of work on writing after breast cancer, cancer in general, but especially breast cancer. They have validated tools. And basically the study says that, uh, boy, I'm, I'm trying to like condense this. And I'm, um, I apologize for, for jumping. Uh, this tool, this functional assessment of cancer therapy hyphen breast means that uh, 17, I think of the items are general for cancer and then they apply it to whatever your cancer is. And they use this validated tool to look at basically quality of life. Here they did it at zero, one, and six months. The non-control group or the control group off to the left had no writing. And as you can see, time heals all wounds over time. They were doing a little bit better in terms of quality of life. Attention control is a group they said on day one, write about your diet. On day two, write about your physicians. On day three, write about your nurses. On day four, write about the medicine. Uh, uh, breast cancer trauma, they said, write specifically about your trauma. And they were doing exercises where each day they would write for 20 minutes. And then the other group that said, you can write about any trauma you want, anything that's happened in your life. And basically, all of the focused writing groups seem to have an improved quality of life. This has been shown over and over and over. Over and over. And over. And and it's uh, this works. You get reflection and framing as you, as a writer, just piece through what's going on. And then this is new to me. Caring consciousness comes from the work of Jean Watson, a nurse educator, now in her 80s out in Colorado, but described this model of patient care where the relationship between patient and nurse uh, can be empathetic because you're equals and you're sharing this experience. All this leads to transformation, which leads to these things that are much more publishable than the less, uh, the less hard data, but fascinating. And this is just shown over and over in cancer writing humanities research. Sadly, Eskin Library does not take the research and drama education, the Journal of Applied Theater and Performance, which is a bummer to me. But this study basically talks about the idea that as an actor, you put on another role, you become another person, that in and of itself can be uh, eye-opening to you as a person. And I'm not sure how you would use this in patient therapy, but they talk about that a little bit. Around on any of the screens, this is a free workshop you can join. Um, I did it just to see what it was. And um, I'm with a, I'm just about to finish up my little cohort, but I'm with a midwife, an internist who's a hospitalist and an ICU nurse, all through them in a major city in Northeast who had devastating COVID experiences and they just like cry and, you know, it's very emotional. I'm trying not to laugh because that's my personality. Um, but, but it's a, it's a very nice, it's free. You don't have to be a writer. You just have to be a clinician. So uh, feel free. They're still signing up for that. We'll skip for a poem again, art for health promotion. There are books for this where they have published so much. They can write a textbook looking at things like community health interventions, looking at the way immigrants from Syria and different countries use social media um, to grow and interact and be better connected with healthcare systems, how kids learn about healthy nutrition with art on the walls in their classrooms. You may or may not remember a television ad from the 80s about your brain on drugs. I would offer to you that that is art and that there's a certain age of people that you can show them a skillet and say, this is your brain. And they'll be like, don't do drugs, right? It's like a knee jerk response. This is a novel about Millard Salter, as you can imagine. Jacob Appel is a 
a, a writer and a, a psychiatrist, a lawyer and an activist. He wrote this about Miller, the fictitious psychiatrist who's 75. It's his birthday this last day and he's decided to commit suicide at the end of the day. And it starts at the very beginning of him waking up, works through the whole day. And he's using art to advocate a certain, a certain view. I won't give you any spoilers about how it ends, but it's very powerful, very well done that art can bring the whole discussion of euthanasia, uh, physician assisted suicide and other things into conversation. Environmental improvement. Vanderbilt's a little weak in this point. If you look at the art around here, there is a place tucked above where our patients' families wait in the main adult hospital. It's a corner they really can't use for anything else. So they just gave it to the arts. And this is what they have up here right now. It just says, see you again. And it's a bunch of blank red things. So I guess that's some artist take on things, a little cynical maybe, but um, you know, our art's a little weak compared to some of the other institutions in town. All right, the next chapter is her last area. I'm just gonna turn it to a whole chapter about education and practice and try to get through this. The visual arts, lots and lots of data about how the arts can help us be better observers as clinicians. So this is a study from Penn that took uh, med students, first year students, I believe, to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. They would have lectures and they would do this kind of spread out over their first year. And then they would, and during this time, they would show them artwork, they would show them retinal images, and they would show them clinical correlations to some of those retinal images. And they would just ask the students to describe what you see. And we'll see that. Um, the ones who took the art course got better. The ones who didn't take the art course got worse, like a lot worse, which I'm not quite sure unless they just got tired of doing the exercise. This is an example of a pre-class description that I'll let you read here, but very vague. It would be hard for me to imagine what this person is seeing. This is the same person after they took their class and this I might be able to draw what they're seeing lots of detail. This is another similar one, we'll skip that. But uh, in 2019, 70 schools offered classes, only four being mandatory. So lots of art electives out there in US medical schools. History of medicine, just briefly, you know, we screw things up over and over the same, oops, ooh, I'm screwing that up. We screw things up over and over. So it's nice to look back at the historical record and see what mistakes we've made, what we can learn. We can sometimes see our own biases. C.S. Lewis says, oh, it could work if we could see the future too, and yet we're limited. So we can only use the past to do this. And again, the vaccine thing strikes close to home. Medical ethics is a whole sub-branch of medical humanities. They have their journals, they have, they're almost independent, but it's something that we do. We don't just take care of one patient in front of us. We're responsible for a population, for a city, for a country, for a world. And that's how our job, just by nature of what we do is gonna interact with policy and law. So when I see things like this, I get really angry because I'm disappointed that politics and ignorance has factored into how we're taking care of patients in our state that has about 38% uh, vaccinated patients for uh, SARS-CoV-2. Professionalism, lots of people try to use the arts for this. Uh, the idea being that professionalism is something that is very well faked, but maybe it's hard to inculcate actual heart change in somebody. And we're gonna skip through some of this. The idea of using literature is that you can watch a character in literature go through some sort of ethical dilemma. You can see how they face it. You can see where they fail, how they grow. And hopefully you can connect with that, maybe grow a little and hopefully it's real. And it's, it's uh, something that's hard to, hard to capture in a quantitative way, the professional level of nurses and physicians and training. I could put Layla's poem up again, but instead I'm gonna refer just that subject uh, to something we all know from American letters of Batman. And that if you wanted to, you know, Batman could be a way to talk about all of these different things, how we lie to patients, when is the good of one matter more than the good of the whole population? We're not gonna stop on this because we're out of time. And it's just, just throwing it out there that, that art can do this or you can just enjoy it as Batman, right? You don't have to appreciate the art. Some people say that this doesn't work. You can't teach professionalism, that empathy is not something that you can really force down people's throat. This person talks about the factors of power dynamic when a patient comes into a healthcare provider that they're coming to you for a reason because you have something in terms of treatment or knowledge they don't have, they don't need. Therefore, by default, you cannot be empathetic. And uh, I'll leave that. Creative writing, striking close to home here. Um, lots of little electives. 
on this, usually not mandatory med schools, it's offered in a lot of context. This group came up with a nominal evaluation. Nominal means, you know, in name only of little value. And basically they took the course survey and published that as their research thesis, which is a little awkward. This is the summary of what their five total, five students um, came up with of how it affected them. And that was their publication. So that's a little sorry. Um, we'll skip this, skip this, same kind of stuff. Um, people don't like poetry. I've learned that myself. Um, uh, the, the, we'll skip this one. So the science, the science is a little soft, a little frustrating, a little unsatisfying because of the nature of art, right? It uses metaphor to try to say things that can't be captured in words. It's subjective. You're going to interpret a piece of art based on your story, where you came from, what art training you've had before, your parents, how nice they were, how mean they were, all that stuff is going to be part of your subjective interpretation of art. It's ambiguous by nature. Um, we'll debate, my brother and I are still fighting about some passages in Hamlet. It's been 25 years and we'll never reach agreement. And art is universal. Every culture, every person has art. You have art at home. Uh, when you're outside of scrubs, you make an artistic choice by what clothes you wear. And the idea here being the big picture is that you engage with art, you have to process it, you then construct meanings, relationships with other pieces of art, relationships with parts of your life, and hopefully that translates into uh, better patient care in terms of empathy, communication, and an ethical mode. Ah, we're getting there. You at work. Chapter five, the last chapter. What's in it for you? All right. So these are some take-home points, more red explosions, reading. Stephen King, American novelist, said, if you want to be a writer, you got to do two things. You got to read a lot and write a lot. And why this matters to you. This is uh, Francesco Petrarca, better known as Petrarch, 1327, went to church, saw a woman named Laura. He was totally blown away. He said, she's so hot. I'm going to write her a poem. And he did. And then he wrote 365 more pieces for her over 50 years. This was awkward for several reasons. He was married to someone else. She was married to someone else. She died happy through that 50 year period. And he continued to write to her. And he only saw her two more times. It's not a question of did he get to first base? He never got to bat. Like he never even talked to her, but he wrote all of these poems, many of them sonnets. We look back today and call him a genius and say he defined, invented whatever the sonnet form. Now we'd probably say this is stalking, this is the restraining order form, but everything that's written today as a sonnet exists in communication with that. And so Shakespeare, John Donne, Terence Hayes, all these sonnets connect, interrelate, there's this big conversation going on. There's an anesthesia conversation going on in our journals, and it existed before all of us were born, most of us, um, and it will exist after us. They might not write you sonnets after you're dead, but there will be anesthesia work done after you're dead. You need to join that conversation. You need to be reading anesthesiology at a minimum every month, just flipping through it. If, if the journal's too hard for you, there's a cliff note for every article. This is from some of our friends here last month. You could just read this. And it might be about you know, a rat kidney at 5% isoflurane for 48 hours. And you might not give a rat mm -hmm, about that rat kidney, but this helps you get into that conversation. So over time, you'll learn to be part of the conversation. So be reading every day. I'll skip this one. Um, this group of people, I would love to have asked you, what do they have in common? They are all journalists or writers. They write to know, they write to figure things out. And as you begin writing, you'll realize you discover things. Um, JK Rowling discovered that Sirius Black was gonna die. She didn't know that the day she sat down to write that scene and was shocked he died. And you learn, remember all writers talk about this, you learn as you write. So I would be writing, journaling, whatever, as you work through your clinical questions. You can skeletonize a paper you like, find something you like and step back and zoom back and say the first paragraph, they talked about the history. Second paragraph, they talked about uh, international work. Third paragraph, they quoted some people. Fourth paragraph, they made a joke. Then they did this, then they did this. Steal those forms, try to break down the skeleton and write in the skeleton they did. Eventually you'll branch out as you work on that piece, but that's a great way to move. Find a small group of people. Uh, Steven is somebody I can send a draft to and he can ridicule and mock and tell me what it's wrong. We have a third part of our little triad that we share with. And these are people who just tell it to me straight. They, they don't hold back any punches. So I would say find a group of peers at your level, got the same publication experience, be sharing with them and, 
and don't be nice to each other. All right, this is my language warning. So uh, if you're Zooming at home, uh, cover your kids' ears. Uh, Anne Lamont is a writer who talks about writing shitty first drafts as something you have to do to just get it down on paper, churn through it because the hardest thing is starting, but just bombing it down on the page and then you'll have something to work with. And she's hilarious. And this is a book of hers that's about writing. She's done novels, memoir, et cetera. But this um, is almost a sacred idea in creative writing circles, these shitty first drafts. So I would encourage you just get through them, get them down on the page, get moving. Five minute brainstorm, an activity that can help you write, sit down with a timer, five minutes, pick a letter, uh, S for Stephen, and you write as many words as you think of in five minutes that start with that word. What this does is it kills that stupid, annoying little editor that tells you this is no good. You know, you need to not do this. Some people use caffeine for this. Um, uh, you know, others have used alcohol. Stephen King, uh, King used cocaine, right? Um, there are books. He says he doesn't even remember writing because he was so high. But better than cocaine for you is five minutes with one letter. And this is a way just to get rid of that editor. So you just try it and you throw it away and then you go start writing your real draft. So there, write as many words as you can in five minutes. Writing out of order, hardest part of any paper to write is the introduction. So you need to do that last because you won't know what you're introducing until you actually write it. So when people start the introduction, hopefully you've learned this by now, that's a fail right there. 15 minutes. Uh, I kind of want to jump ahead because we're running out of time. Uh, do something today that extends beyond today for at least 15 minutes, right? Invest in your future career with 15 minutes. Don't let today only be about today. All right, the last part, very last slides. The epilogue is you. You, dear listener, are the epilogue. All of you are beautiful, wonderful, unique, unique creations capable of making beautiful, wonderful, unique art. This is going to be different for all of us. It will be grilling steaks. It will be taking pictures. It will be writing poems. It will be riding a horse. It can be dancing in your kitchen when no one's looking. It can be hosting a party, tending a garden, playing piano, singing in church. Art is going to be different. It's going to come from the place in your life where your talents, skills, abilities, and your mind meet your uh, passions, feelings, desires, your heart. Where your heart and mind come together, they're going to unlock each other. That's going to be the place in your life where you can do the best work. You need to do this for you. You need to do this for your family, for your chairman, for your department, for your patients, for your community, for the whole world. You have to do this. We need this. So that's my mandate to you. Go find that place in your life, make good art, and we can live happily ever after. Yeah.